The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. Karen, what are you doing with my Sega Saturn? Well, I had a thought. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since we've done a teardown. Right. It's been even longer since we've done anything with Sega. Mm -hmm. So I thought today we could do a teardown of your Sega Saturn. Oh yeah, that sounds fun. I don't think I've ever actually taken this thing apart. What? Yeah, but I do remember that it is a very complicated system and that's one of the reasons it didn't have a lot of support from third parties. Hmm. So I guess we could take it apart and see just how overcomplicated it is. Sounds good. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Okay, by popular request, we're going to do a teardown of the Sega Saturn. Now the Sega Saturn was the what? One, two, three, fourth generation Sega console. Came out in North America in 1995. They had a famously uh, rushed launch because I think they're trying to beat the PlayStation. Oh look, there's a game inside, Wing Arms. I don't think it's worth anything. I do have a couple of my Saturn games on eBay, but not that one. Yeah, so this was, uh, you know, I guess it wasn't Sega's first CD-based system because they had the Sega CD that plugged into the Sega Genesis. Uh, yeah, but this is, you know, a true, you know, sequel system instead of all that 32X CD nonsense they had where you bolted it together and you had three power supplies. That's ridiculous. It was so egregious that they actually had a custom power strip you could buy just for your Sega system where the power bricks would go on um, perpendicular <laughs> to the strip because otherwise in a row they wouldn't fit. Yeah, so this was, you know, supposed to be the competitor to the Sony PlayStation. Of course, the Sony PlayStation annihilated it because this thing launched at 400 bucks and the PlayStation launched at 300 bucks. No company would ever make that mistake again. Oh, wait. All right, so we have a Sega multi-out on the back. I was actually testing this yesterday at home. The only uh, video connector I had was an RF connector, and I plugged it into my, my 4K TV that has an antenna still, and I was able to get a picture from this. So I guess modern TVs still have analog tuners in them. Uh, hmm, this compartment here, I believe this holds the battery. So it had, yep, it had a battery backup for your games, and you could get a uh, memory cartridge to put in here. That would allow you to have more backup spaces. I think this battery is totally dead. Oh yeah. Wait. Yeah, it's mostly dead. All right. Power button, open, reset. I think I bought this one probably in the late 90s when they were like giving them away pretty much. There's some really cool games for the system though. Friend of mine, I knew way back from high school, Chris Tesmer. He kind of got me hooked on the Saturn. He was always getting these Japanese import games. So he had, he had all the great games like Radiant Silver Gun, Silhouette Mirage, all that stuff. So if he ever needs to retire, he could just sell that on eBay now because those games are worth a lot. Master System, Genesis, Saturn. Not very consistent. I mean, at least Atari was like, you know, obsessed with cats. Although I guess they only ever released, what, two cat related systems? The Lynx and the Jaguar. All right, here comes the lid. Oh, that's nice. Oh, it has a nice mechanical spring-loaded lid, so it opens smoothly instead of like, right? Early PlayStations had that too. Oh my gosh, look at this. Look, that's a light pipe. You might think it's an upside down icicle. It's not. So basically there's an LED down there and then they put a big acrylic light pipe on it to bring the light up to the indicator hole. It's cheaper than making a separate little circuit board. Well, clearly on the left here, we have a AC to DC power supply. Uh, let's uh, disconnect it. Looks like it's just held in place by a couple screws. Also, TJ Miller worked pretty well in Deadpool. Sometimes he's kind of annoying. All right. Wow, it's very well labeled. Nine volts at 0.3 amps, five volts at two amps, 3.3 volts at 0.6 amps, ground ground. Oh, this must be the uh, lid open switch, if I had to guess. Yeah, looks like it. All right, where shall I attack next? Eh, let's remove this power switch. Denzel Washington will smooth out your music. All right. 
AC power switch with a capacitor on it. Put that over there. Okay, it looks like we've got a ribbon cable going to control the CD-ROM, another ribbon cable going to the controller port. I guess that makes sense. Oh, and then this is just insulation to, uh, you know, protect this from the AC power. Oh, the light tube's getting in the way. The light tube looks like a, a urine icicle. Why couldn't a urine icicle exist? Yeah, it looks like this is shock mounted. Ribbon cable should just pull out. Yep. Oh, I'll just held in with love, I guess. And a grounding strap. If you were to try to make a portable of this, the CD-ROM would be the most difficult part of it. Probably be best off finding a uh, SD to CD-ROM replacement. I would bet that someone has made that. I know they have it for the uh, Dreamcast. So basically, you can take your Sega Dreamcast, remove the clunky mechanical disc assembly, and then replace it with a solid state card reader, which does the same function. Now, don't let anyone on YouTube tell you different. Sega was really cool in the 90s. Even Sonic the Hedgehog used to be super cool. Oh my lord. Wait, what, what goes here? Oh, you know what? I bet that's the MPEG decoder pack. Some, look at, something must go there. Look at that. I guess that makes sense because that big door was kind of overkill for just, uh, just a battery. I'm gonna remove the ribbon cables and then we'll see what we can find. All right, let's take a look. So we have two CPUs, because the best way to make your system really easy to program is to have two processors in it. It's a master and a slave. Then on the back of the unit, we have a ROM. So this is the ROM that is used when the system boots up. Basically, you know, the bootstrap ROM. There's a multi-purpose ASIC here. It probably is doing some sort of bus arbitration, like, oh, look, it's trying to access this memory or trying to access this peripheral. I will control it. Um, Sega's had that on systems in the past. Like the Sega Master System also has a custom ASIC, oh, I'm sorry, application-specific integrated circuit that is used to control things on the bus. Right below that, we have two four megabit chips, so eight megabits of work RAM for the CPUs. There's another combined chip over here, which is eight megabits of work RAM. So that is 16 M lowercase b work RAM. I wonder how much RAM is in this thing. We'll find out. So by the CPUs, we have this control chip. So this basically does peripheral controls like the game controllers. All right, let's work our way over here. I wasn't able to identify this chip. I really don't know what it does, but it's near the add-on MPEG decoder, so maybe it does something with that. However, right next to it, we have a four megabit memory chip, and that is used for the CD-ROM controller to cache the data coming off of the CD-ROM. So that's 512K. It's quite a jump if you remember when we did that uh, Nintendo PlayStation prototype, it only had a 32K cache. So this is like what? Many more? Mandy more? 16 times bigger? Yes. Okay, we have a system control chip. So again, this thing is so complicated with so many systems, they need a big custom chip just to control everything, like a conductor of a circus or an orchestra, not a conductor of electricity. Although I suppose if a symphony conductor was hit with a lightning bolt, he or she would conduct electricity. They would not be sharp anymore. They would be flat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. We have the VDP1 and the VDP2. These are the two graphic processors that handle everything in the system. I believe one of them does the sprites, which also become the polygons in the 3D games, and the other one concentrates on backgrounds. Oh, what's this? It's Motorola 68000. Of course they have one. Uh, so. It's kind of interesting because Sega's done that twice in a row. They take the CPU of their previous system and they use it as the audio controller for their new system. For instance, the Sega Master System had a Z80 CPU. Then the Sega Genesis had a Z80 as the audio driving CPU, which also enabled backwards compatibility. And of course, the main processor of the Genesis was a Motorola 68000. In the Saturn, they've continued the tradition of using a chip from the previous system as the audio driver. Right next to that, we have a custom audio controller. So the Sega Saturn actually does a pretty good job of generating its own music and sound effects instead of just streaming them off of the CD. And that's what this Yamaha part here does. And then we have four megabits of RAM for that system. So I'll write that down. 
four megabit sound. Pretty much covers everything on the front of the unit. Let's jump to the back. Rip. So we, we talked about this ROM already, and that's what you know boots up the system. And that makes sense because if you think about it, it's basically behind the CPU RAM, and it would be mapped to the same address space, so that makes sense. Right next to it, we have a two megabit RAM chip, which is used for the internal battery-backed saves. So two megabit would be 256K. Okay, then over here, we have all of the video memory. Okay, let's add up all of the RAM that the video system uses. Okay, so we have four megabit VRAM right there, and then we have four two megabit frame buffer and VDP RAMs. Okay, uh, yes, two, 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 two. I think the Sega Saturn is like a master course in how not to design a system. It's just so overdone. My name is whoever designed the Saturn. I will teach you how to design a really overly complicated game system. You know, if Atari had designed this, they would have called it 64-bit because there's two 32-bit processors. And if you add 32 and 32, you get 64. All right, so what's the total? Let's see, 16 plus four plus four plus two plus four plus two plus two plus two plus two, 38 megabits divided by eight. Drum roll, 4.75 megabytes. That's actually more than I would have thought. I believe that is definitely more than the PlayStation has. Although again, it's so spread out, it kind of is less efficient because it's all over the place. Well, you know, as far as making this new a portable, which I'm sure is the first thing everyone would say, ah, look how big it is. It's like way too big. And then, you know, you know what that means? It means it's gonna consume a lot of energy or power. Yeah, I think I'll just put in a fresh battery and then reassemble this. Well, Karen, I finally got to take apart my Sega Saturn and see all of the chips inside. You know, I think we're starting to run out of consoles to tear down that we haven't torn down before. Yeah, but there's probably some out there still. Maybe the community could give us some ideas. <gasps> What a great suggestion, Ben. Do you have an idea for a console that we haven't torn down yet? Tell us about it on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. We should go play Sega Genesis now. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have Genesis like, does. I had Sonic Spinball. Spin all over the place. Well, oh, see, so you like pinball and I like Sonic, so we can combine them into Sonic Spinball. Yeah, you know, I didn't really care for Sonic Spinball. I'm not surprised it wasn't a great game. No, it was really slow and it was clearly not developed by the people who developed the regular Sonic games. And there was no saves or cheats or anything, so you had to play all the way through the levels yeah. to get to the future levels. And I remember once I finally got to level like five or six and then died, and it was really depressing. It was very clearly developed by Western developers. Because that was the point when they were switching from the Japanese back to the uh, to the Western developers, and it definitely did not feel like the, you know, the Sonic Prime mm -hmm. games. Yeah. In this episode, we're going to be finishing up the mini pinball prototype kit. Felix, I see you have some PCBs. Yep, we got our new PCBs back from uh, Osh Park. Oh, sweet. So in this episode, we're gonna take this board, make sure that it works, install it in our pinball case, and then get our prototype game made. Oh, cool, I did a loop. Repeat after me, 3D printing is not magic. I might be recomplicating this. 